Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is a classic travel journal. A record of Bert's search for information about our world and how we fit into it. Bert travels to the source of each story, trying to find the connections between our history and what is happening today. What he discovers can improve our lives and our understanding of the world around us. And of course, there's always Bert's slightly irreverent sense of humor. Uh-oh. Oh. oh, my goodness. We're going to need a bigger can. Well, we walked away with a split decision. As I travel around the world working on my television programs, I'm constantly confronted with the need to make decisions. Where should we go? How should we get there? Where should we stay? Where should we eat? What should the program be about? Should I get Robert De Niro's makeup team from the Irishman to fill in my ball spot? I'm saying to the best of my recollection. Decision making is a constant challenge. Rocky Road or Cherry Garcia? Should the party of the first part propose marriage? Should the party of the second part accept or reject the offer? Snap out of it! The software system that controls our emotional responses has been around for millions of years, and it does a great job. It constantly updates its information by what it hears and sees around you, and it's capable of making an almost instant decision, and that's great except there are some decisions that should not be made instantly, and a lot more research should be gathered before that decision is made. A while ago, I came across a book titled Decisions. It was written by Robert Dylan Schneider. For over 30 years, he has been advising major corporations, leading families and individuals on mergers and acquisitions, government relations, and international media. In essence, he helps his clients understand what they really, really want and how to achieve it. If they read the book, whether they talk about, read about Joan of Arc or Henry Ford or Giannini or Picasso or any of these people, they should come away with a feeling for their own lives and something they can apply in their own life that'll make a difference for them in their life. I think virtually everybody that's in that book uh, entered what they entered into without knowing quite what the result was going to be. When they saw the result beginning to take shape, they said to themselves, there's something I can do here, something big, something for society. Uh, Madame Curie, Louis Pasteur, people like that, that are in the book, Martin Luther in the book, uh, they all made decisions and went beyond what the obvious was. And uh, it's important to be able to do that in life. In other words, life is so simple, it's important to go beyond the obvious. <laughs> On August 8, 1945, an American bomber dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Two days later, a second atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Within days of the Nagasaki bombing, the Japanese surrendered and the Second World War was over. The final United Nations victory has been won. The war is over. Peace is here. Harry Truman was the president of the United States at the time and responsible for making the decision to drop the bombs. The world has never been the same. Truman was good at making up his mind, which is not as easy as it sounds, especially in relation to using the atomic bomb. He needed to get all the information he possibly could and understand what was best for most of the people in the United States. He had to be willing to listen to a lot of people, all kinds of people, and find out what effect the decision he was about to make would have on the world. And when he made up his mind and felt that he was correct, he needed to go through with that decision. By most accounts, the tipping point for Truman was the number of American and Allied troops 
that would be killed as the war dragged on. The Japanese were on the run. They were probably just months from being defeated. But Truman's military advisors estimated that the casualties from continuing to follow the Japanese from small island to small island, and ultimately to the home islands, would allow the enemy to set the pace and draw the Allies along. And that would result in the death of over a million Americans. What did you learn from Harry Truman? Harry Truman was brave. Uh, he was alone. Uh, at the end of his life, and the reason I like Harry Truman, he was asked by the press, what are you going to do after you've been president, Mr. President? And Truman said, I'm going to pack my bags, go to back to Independence, Missouri, I'll go to the third floor, unpack my bag, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I liked so much about Harry Truman. He was everybody's man. Uh, he was alone when he made that decision to uh, drop the bomb. It must have been brutal. Uh, he took advice from everybody. It must have been incredibly difficult to uh, take all that advice and figure out what to do. But at the end of the day, Harry Truman said to himself, if I drop the bomb, I can end the war. If I end the war, it's going to save more lives. It'll put civilization back on the course it needs to be on. And I thought that was pretty good. Was there any special techniques he used to reach the decision? Harry Truman took every bit of advice he could possibly get. In today's environment in Washington or Paris or London, Rome, Moscow, you get more advice than you want. Harry Truman had a kitchen cabinet, a group of people that he trusted, a group of people that he knew if he rejected their advice would not reject him. And I think that was really positive. So he got objective advice, and he took the objective advice, parsed it down. He might get 100 pages of advice and take one page. But that one page was golden, and he was smart enough to know how to get it and then use it. Years later, Winston Churchill wrote about the decision in a book, and here's what he said. British consent in principle to the use of the weapon had been given. The final decision now lay with the president. Truman had the weapon, but I never doubted what it would be, nor have I ever doubted that he was right. There was unanimous, automatic, and unquestioned agreement around our table, nor did I ever hear the slightest suggestion that we should have done otherwise. In July of 1936, General Francisco Franco started a civil war in order to overthrow the legitimate Republican government of Spain. The Republican government was looking for ways to bring General Franco's cruelty to the attention of the world. In Paris, in 1937, an exhibition was being organized that was going to deal with art and technology in the modern world. The Republican government of Spain saw it as an ideal opportunity to focus people's attention on Franco's brutality. A delegation of Spanish politicians and people of importance came to Paris in the hope of getting Picasso to paint a mural for the Spanish pavilion at the exposition. Picasso was 56 years old and hadn't lived in Spain for 30 years. In fact, he would never live in Spain again. But he kept his Spanish passport and felt very strongly about the cause of the Republic. Would Picasso, who at the time was the world's most famous artist, paint a mural for the Republican government? It was not a project he wanted to get involved in. Spain and the rest of Europe was in turmoil. Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin were spreading terror, which included playing key roles in the Spanish Civil War. Countries would use the exposition as a proxy for their conflicts with each other. And things were not great at home. Picasso had a wife and a child. He also had a child by a previous mistress and was just starting a new love affair with a new mistress. This guy got around. He listened to the delegation from Spain and sort of said, mm, no. But then he sort of said, yes. He was undecided, but not for long. On April 27, 1937, German and Italian aircraft operating in cooperation with Franco's troops 
bombed the northern Spanish town of Guernica. The town had no military significance. Thousands of people were killed. Franco wanted to terrify the public, and Italy and Germany wanted to test their new weapons. The war correspondent, George Steele, was on site and immediately issued the first reports on the atrocity. The headline in the Times of London read, The Tragedy of Guernica, Town Destroyed in Air Attack, Eyewitness Account. In Paris, Picasso read the stories and saw the first appalling photographs. In a frenzy of anger, he suddenly knew he would paint a mural for the exhibition and Guernica would be the subject. He knew what he needed to do. Guernica is considered the greatest painting of anti-war defiance ever created. Its rejection of human barbarity and its cry for liberty and peace remain as insistent today as the day Picasso put down his brush in 1937. Picasso was not the first artist to depict war and its aftermath. As a classical trained artist, Picasso was familiar with many battlefield paintings. Rubens' Consequence of War, Copley's The Death of Major Pearson, Goya's The Third of May, and Sargent's Gast. These works generally featured warfare's effect on its military participants. Picasso's aim was to show its effect on civilians, the innocent citizens who were often cited by leaders as the reason the war is waged in the first place. The color palette of Guernica represents another area of artistic decision-making. From his blue and his rose periods, we know that Picasso knew how to use color to illustrate a mood. Prior to the war, his work was characterized by a profusion of color. With his deliberate decision to use only white, muted blacks and grays and a little blue, Picasso showed us how he wanted us to feel. After the exposition ended, Guernica began touring the world, keeping the tragic situation front and center in the mind of the public. After the war ended, Picasso sold the painting to the Spanish government with the understanding that it would never be exhibited in Spain as long as Franco was alive. Eventually, the ever more fragile painting was shipped to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. It remained there on permanent display until it was transferred to Spain in 1981, which was the 100th anniversary of Picasso's birth. The work is now on display in Madrid, protected by glass and guards. Despite the painting's specific geographic title and the historical source of its inspiration, Guernica is universal. The huge picture is a giant poster, testimony to the horror that the Spanish Civil War was causing and a warning of what was to come in the Second World War. A tapestry version of Guernica hangs in the United Nations building in New York City. It was a gift from the Nelson Rockefeller estate, and it's located in the hallway outside the entrance to the Security Council. It's a space where TV crews often gather for press conferences. When Secretary of State Colin Powell came to the Security Council on February 5, 2003, to discuss invading Iraq, UN officials temporarily covered up the tapestry with a blue curtain and flags of various nations. This was either to provide a better backdrop for the cameras or more likely to prevent the bizarre contrast of Picasso's image as a background for the announcement of a new war. Picasso was an extraordinary person. Uh, he was one of the great marketers of all time without being a marketer. Uh, Picasso never gave the sense that he was a marketer. At one point, I'll never forget this, there was a restaurant in Geneva, I think, or maybe it was Zurich, and a meal had to get paid for, and Picasso simply drew on the tablecloth, and that paid for the meal. Uh, he operated in continents across the world. He had a reputation that was phenomenal, and all Picasso had to do was show up. Uh, there are probably better artists 
out there today than Picasso. But they don't have Picasso's sense of being, a sense of who he is. I think he came to that decision because he was forced to by the regime. I think he wanted to make a statement about the regime and the fact that he didn't necessarily agree with it. And of course, the regime didn't agree with him. And, uh, and he did it. I think a lot of people do that today, uh, but uh, they don't do it with the same flair Picasso did. Picasso made a statement. A lot of artists don't know how to do that. There's a story that a German general was standing next to Picasso in a museum and looking at Guernica. The general turned to Picasso and asked him, did you do this? And Picasso answered, no, you did. On April 18, 1906, at 516 in the morning, every church bell in San Francisco began to ring. There was a deep rumbling sound throughout the city. Within 48 seconds, over 5,000 buildings collapsed. In less than a minute, the great San Francisco earthquake was over. But the real damage was caused by the fires that followed the quake and lasted for five days. In 1906, the buildings and the streets of San Francisco were filled with gas lines and gas lamps. And when they ruptured, the city went up in flames. The earthquake and the fire also destroyed the city's banks. Most of the bank vaults were unreachable. And when you could reach them, the locks had melted and you couldn't open them. And inside, the currency and the stock certificates had disintegrated. Members of the traditional financial community began meeting and trying to decide what should or should not be done. Days passed without any meaningful activity. But there was one exception, Amadeo Pietro Giannini. Giannini was born in 1870 in San Jose, California. He was one of three children in a family of Italian immigrants. His father had come to California to work the gold rush, but eventually decided to buy some land and grow fruits and vegetables. At one point, Amadeo took over the business and became one of the most successful produce brokers in the Santa Clara Valley. When he was 31 years old, he sold his business and went to work for a bank, the Columbus Savings and Loan. He noticed that the bank only dealt with wealthy people and that the everyday folks were ignored. He suggested to the bank that they change their policy and take care of the everyday folks like the everyday folks in the family he grew up in. The bank told him, forget about it. So in 1904, he went off and started his own bank. He called it the Bank of Italy and opened it in a saloon in the North Beach area. He attracted working people who wanted to buy houses and open their own businesses. He came to be known as the Little Fellows Banker. Within a year, his bank had deposits of $700,000, which would be about $17 million in today's money. Giannini knew how important it was to be trusted by someone who would lend money with the only collateral of promise to pay it back. He understood that a loan like that could be the first rung of a ladder for individual success. Because Giannini was not part of the official banking community of San Francisco, he was not invited to the mayor's meetings. That meant he could do whatever he wanted to do. And what he wanted to do was help the people of San Francisco who needed the most help. In spite of the fact that parts of the city were still in flames, he raced to his bank and was able to get out the money. Then he took two barrels, set up a board between them, and opened for business. He began lending money. His only condition was that the borrower promised to use the money to rebuild. It seems that every single dollar was eventually repaid. Giannini made two extraordinary decisions. First, that his bank was going to deal with everyday people, normal folks. And second, his bank was going to open its office in the neighborhood where those people lived. 
That altered the entire banking system and gave us what we have today. Throughout his lifetime, until his death in 1949, he spread his vision of serving the regular customer. He never forgot his own roots. He addressed the complex needs of the major industries in California. Like movies and wine production. That's good. Hey, how are we and with the same attention to detail as he did for his immigrant customers. He continually focused on the needs of his hometown of San Francisco. His bank was the major investor in the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge. In 1928, he merged the Bank of Italy with the Bank of America. Giannini was incredible. Uh, he uh, ran the Bank of America, of course, which was one of the great banks of our time. And he recognized there were so many people, not just in California, but coming to California in different parts of the United States that didn't have the financial wherewithal to realize the American dream. Giannini gave them the chance to do it. And he did it by being brave. He did it by being courageous. He took risks that uh, most people don't take today. I'll never forget Jimmy Stewart in the very famous film where Stewart comes back from the war and he gives a, uh, a loan to somebody. And the head of the bank says, you can't do that. And Stewart said, if I don't do that, our country, our community won't prosper. And he gave him the loan and the country and the community did prosper. Giannini did the same thing. You said it, Jimmy. Right on. Are there a few things you can suggest that I should do before I make a decision? Bert, it's very tough to give you advice on making a decision, but let me take a stab at a couple of thoughts. One is less is more. Uh, always think of a few things you can do rather than the whole broad panoply of things. Two is stick to your bedding. In other words, if you think this is the way to go, do it. Now put your whole effort behind it. Number three is don't take credit. Give the credit to other people. They do the job generally for you, and give the credit and the opportunity to them. Number four is look around corners. Always look for things that aren't there now and say to yourself, there's something I could do as a result of that that I didn't plan on in the beginning. I'm going to do that. It can generally make a lot of money and a lot of good feelings for people around you when you do that. Those are pieces of advice for what they're worth. Having consulted with my trusted associates, we have decided that all of the allotted time for this program has been used up and the decision has been made to say goodbye. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Play it again, Sam, for old time's sake. You must remember this. Good idea. If you'd like to see this program again, or any of the hundreds of programs we've made for our public broadcasting stations, or see the material that was great, but we couldn't fit it into the program, you can see it all on BertWolf.com or YouTube Bert Wolf. This could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs>